So it's uh, easy to build software, but can you build software in a scalable way, in a way that uh, it can be tolerant to faults, where software is resilient? So these are some of the concerns, uh, you know, that uh, Naveen looks at. So to uh, uh, like to uh, achieve these kind of uh, what do you call uh, goals, uh, he looks at software from the perspective of design and architecture. So when you listen to his talk, uh, you will see some, uh, always he brings the focus back to design and architecture, not just you know writing code. And uh, if you look at his uh, career, he has worked in many of the big uh, companies, uh, including uh, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Target, IBM, uh, and so on. So it's my pleasure to invite uh, Naveen uh, to deliver this talk. Over to you, Naveen. Uh, thanks, folks, for making time on a, in the middle of a weekend to attend this talk. Uh, hope all of you can see my screen. Yes, I can see it. Yeah. Uh, folks, this, uh, today's session will be a combination of a presentation as well as a code demonstration. Uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me with questions uh, anytime during this session. Java 8 introduced uh, introduce lambdas and method references, which kind of uh, helped adoption of uh, functional programming in the Java world. There is a lot more to functional programming than method references and uh, yeah, lambdas. So this is the uh, set of topics I thought I wanted to talk about. My previous session spoke about algebraic types and pattern matching. In today's session, I'll talk about monads, which are like the fundamental design patterns of the functional programming world. Uh, yeah. In this slide, I'm talking, I'm demonstrating how merge sort works. You can think of there are uh, to start with there are eight sorted lists sublists of size one. Upon the first uh, pass, you end up with four uh, sublists of size two, and then two sublists of size four, and finally a list of size eight. The takeaway here is. You start with a sublist of size one and gradually move to sorted sublist of bigger size. This kind of uh, programming model is prevalent in many things what we do in software development. For those of you who attended my previous session, I demonstrated things like uh, pattern matching and uh, functions such as size calculation. These are examples of recursive programming, which I assume most of us are familiar to. What Java programmers might not be familiar is the concept of recursive data types. A list is a, a non-empty list is a concatenation of a sublist called which I'm calling as tail here and the head. So a list recursively gets broken down into an, uh, another list of size n minus one and this repeats. This is true. This can be true for lists. This is true for trees and other data structures. So concept of recursive data types is a fundamental uh, thinking style in the world of functional programming. 
as programmers, we look at a sub problem of the same type as uh, all of us are familiar with. And here are, we look at a sub part of the same type, a list of size n minus one or a sub tree in a, in a tree and so on. I'll speak about some mathematical constructs in this uh, session. The first property is closure. Given a set, if you take two integers and add them, the set being integers, the result is an integer, which means the result is also part of the same set. Closure property is true for addition on the set of integers. The same is not true for division because dividing two integers can result in a float and not an integer. This is the first property I want you, uh, you folks to be cognizant of. The second property is associativity. If you had to uh, add three numbers, which are one, two, and three, you can add one and two first, and then uh, add three to it. So the order of uh, collapsing does not matter as long as you keep uh, processing adjacent pairs, adjacent elements in uh, in a set in this uh, expression. So associated is an example. The same is no, not true for subtraction. Other problem I want to talk about is commutative. You can interchange the operands for addition and still get the same value. But the same thing is not true for, say, concatenation of strings. One of the key things uh, in algebra is the concept of identity. In addition, if you add 0 to A or A to 0, the result is equivalent to A. So 0 is the identity for multiplication. Uh, folks, I hope all of you are comfortable with, uh, with these constructs. Yes. So if you draw inspiration from this into programming, here's an example uh, function I wrote in the last session to calculate the size of a list. The size returns an integer. Integer is a set, can be mapped to a set. Zero is the identity for addition which is the operator employed here. So the combination of integer, the type integer, the operator addition, and its identity is zero has been employed here. Now these three together encapsulate a concept in the mathematical world which doesn't uh, which is traditionally is not known well known in the in the in the world of programmers so in this uh, i'll uh, we'll go into details of this The folks remember how I spoke up, I demonstrated an identity and a binary operator. These together can be encapsulated in a concept called monoid. Monoid, the, uh, we are not defined the set yet. Given a set, a uh, associative operator 
which is closed and has identity is called a monoid and given a list where every element is part of a, a type or a set e we can if the corresponding uh, set forms a monoid we can fold on it i will demonstrate few examples here here's a simple example i have defined a monoid for addition the identity is zero the operator is addition and uh, as we know uh, addition is a associative operation given this and you have a list of three elements 1 2 3 you can pass this monoid definition and the list applies it internally and it gets the res result back in this case it happens to be 6 now in instead of addition and zero, uh, zero as the identity if i were to pass multiplication as the operator and one as the identity i can just pass a different monoid definition and my definition of list can fold on it okay let me try to make it interactive uh, folks how do you find the list of how do you find the average of a list of uh, integers yeah find the sum and divide by the number of elements can you do it in one pass arvind well in the first pass you find the sum you keep track of the number of elements yeah but if you were to still you use only my uh, fold semantics uh, and pattern matching you can okay so but uh, assume that you have a tuple where the first part of it is the sum and the second part is the count how do you prove that your code is will work Arvind, I'm uh, not sure. We have so, test cases. We have to write a test case, I guess. Yeah, that Suppose is the list of five uh, elements. Uh, you take one element, two elements. So with each iteration, you have a result that can be checked. It's not proving. It's just testing that particular yes. input. Yes. So like you said, testing can prove the presence of bugs. not the absence of bugs yeah now sum is is done via monoid count is a monoid so you can calculate you can find you can update the monoid in one pass and after the one pass you can just do the uh, division divide one by the other that proves that you can i mean your program is valid the take away i'm having here is as uh, given that we have uh, done mathematics in our school and colleges we we know that we know how induction works we know how recursion works similarly this is a kind of uh, divide and conquer where we clearly 
can prove to ourselves that this uh, this class of problems work without bugs by application of mathematical constructs we can be a lot more sure of uh, our programs this slide is the the java doc from the streams api which does the same thing there is a identity there is a binary operator here it talks about associative accumulation function and so on so in fact, i was going to ask you about reduce so it, this is very much i thought it was very much like reduce yeah i mean the terms are overloaded in the functional programming uh, what java calls reduce the functional program is called as folding but again the information about identity binary operator and association is scattered in the java doc representation if they had used the word monoid here things would have been lot more i mean we would have had a first class construct to reason about these kind of problems uh if you have a function to cal calculate the longest in a list of strings what would you what would be the return type longest string you mean in that list yes so it would be a string okay uh, uh index of return? the longest string sorry in index of the longest string maybe a int can be returned okay let's stick with what arvin mentioned okay now if the string is if the list is empty what would be the return type what would be the return value we have to define it or else it will return null yeah so why not empty string well if you have a list with one element or multiple elements where the longest is empty string then we don't have that differentiation i guess exactly so you can think of this operator does not have a identity so mathemat uh, in mathematics these things are lot more well understood monoid as what i uh, i demoed earlier is an oper an associative operator which is an identity semi group is an is a algebraic structure which has no identity if you go back to this slide the java streams api provides a reduce which returns a t and takes a identity but there is a parallel signature which does not take a identity but not return a, a t so the the designers of this a, this library are aware of the limitations of uh, what can be folded but again my crib is having gone this far had they used a semi group construct here it would have been lot more uh, understandable and unambiguous again the point here is understanding of the math taking a mathematical view of programming is beneficial in reducing a class of problems so if it was an empty string does it mean that the list was empty or the longest string 
was empty, it becomes easy to differentiate. Yeah, there are many monoids in programming. The type Boolean with the operator on or and the identity false forms a monoid. Similarly, Boolean and and true is a monoid. Integer and float with addition and zero is a monoid. Integer float multiplication with an identity of one is a monoid. String concatenation with empty string is also another monoid. Uh, folks, I assume all of you have traveled by uh, by airplane sometime. Yes, no. Yeah. So in the airport, you need to go through security. Once you go through security, you can walk with. Naveen, I'm not getting audio. Uh, folks, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you who, uh, get my question? Yeah, walk through security. That part I got. Yeah. Once you walk through security, you don't have to undergo a security uh, another uh, more screenings while you are in the sterile area. But if you walk back out of security gates, you need to. What's the idea behind it? Once you cross the kind of that border between sterile and unsterile, you are considered you have to go through it again. Yeah, so within the sterile area, there are uh, clear bounds ensuring that you cannot, uh, if you have clear security, you are secure. So you can operate in the sterile area as long as uh, you want. That's a takeaway from this slide. Uh, folks, OK, go back to demo. If you are given a list of anything, you can filter on it with a predicate. The result is a list. So it's like, if you were a list and you underwent a filter, the resulting type is a list. So you're still operating in the world of lists. So this kind of moving from a list to the list is one of the uh, styles employed in functional programming. So I demonstrated map in my previous session. So for every element in a list, we, we found their square and got a new list. So corresponding to one, you got a one. Corresponding to two, you got a four. Corresponding to three, you got a nine. The way a filter of a list gave you back a, another list, the map of a list gave you another list. It's like staying in the sterile area. This is more of a pictorial representation of the same. There is a function which takes an integer and which returns a integer. So 
f can is a is a function that goes from int to int now list gives a capability to go from a list of e to a list of f so this was a list of e by applying a map by supporting a mapping capability you get back a list of f this is similar to staying in the sterile area metaphor i spoke about what is the difference between e and f are you saying the type can change yes so i can instead of uh, x times x i can do a division so i get a list of float so here's another We moved from a list of strings to a list of integers. That is what I was trying to demonstrate here. Oh, uh, folks. How many of you have seen, have you used design patterns in your day job? Hello. Yeah, I have used. So name design pattern you used, uh, Arvin. Factory pattern. Oh, uh, that is. Yeah. That in is what programming language? In. What programming language have you employed it in? Factory pattern in uh, C sharp dot net. Okay, C sharp. Did you have a class named factory? Uh, I think I created it. Yeah, but it will be in the context of say entity A, entity B, and entity factory, or some and so on. Yeah. You will not have a class called factory. So what I'm saying is, you may have your implementation of factory for a particular scenario, but you may not have factory as a class which you can instantiate in different contexts. Does it make yeah, sense? Yeah, that's correct. So, functor is a pattern. List is a instance of this pattern. For a class to be to be a functor, it has to represent. It has to uh, follow some laws. The laws are if you map, it has a map, it should have a map function. And if you, if the function that is mapping is an ID function, the result is the original, uh, the original functor comes back.
and the identity function is basically given x and written back x then the resulting instance is equal to the original list this is the first law and the second law is actually is also very interesting you can combine functions to form a composite function the result of mapping a composite function is equivalent to two consecutive max, maps with the two functions separately i'll give an example there is a string dot length method given a string find its length another function which says is the integer boolean or not so even or not so java provides a mechanism of doing function composition so here you have a list having two strings hello and hi the results of mapping the composite function here is the same of taking the same list mapping the first function f you get a new list followed by another map function you get us another list so the result of f and then g is the same as list of map of f and then a map of g so this is a law these are the laws which can classify if a container is a functor or not now moment so instead of reasoning separately for lists and sets and something else we have a higher level of abstraction where we can reason at a, a higher level the pattern here is of a functor hope that makes sense i i had a small question does the definition of functor depend on what g and h are no as long g and f can be any functions function as defined by mathematics No, is of it course. possible that uh, depending on what G and H are, certain containers can become functors in you know a certain context? Uh, that might be true. But more importantly, if F and G are functions, functors behave like this. I hope you got the difference. I I did so. irrespective of what g and h are if it follows this law i can be sure that it's a functor yes thank you so folks like the navin one question what, what yes, do you please. mean by uh, container in the previous example so you list is a container function. list is a container okay we have not defined the it's a generic type you don't know what goes into a list it could be integers it could be floats it could be doubles it could be a string or it could be any custom type okay got it uh folks this is a good time to ask questions okay given three types here this diagram the left hand side is talking about functions which go from float to int int to float int to string float to string and ids the left hand side is in the world of functions the right hand side is in the uh, world of containers or the list container in particular so if you have a list of integer and you draw a map you get a list of strings if you have a list of float and you have a two in um, uh, two in uh, you map the two in function you get a list of integers like you can operate in the world of functions here 
similarly you can operate in the in the, in the world of lists so all the goodness of a list is maintained when you do a, a filter and a map this is take away from this slide But uh, yeah, as a follow up to that, uh, instead of map or filter, if I use reduce, then I'm coming out of the sterile area. Yes, yes, you are. Great observation, Arvin. So yeah, this is a representation. The st uh, string length was function G, the ease bool, uh, ease, even check was F and uh, the result of two steps was equivalent to the result of one step using the composite function. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Navin. Yes. Uh, I had a question uh, related to the point that uh, Arvind sir and you just mentioned. Can you please elaborate on that for uh, filter map and then for sterile, uh, the uh, sorry for the reduce that it's out of the sterile area. I didn't quite completely get sure. the point. Okay. The map function operates on a list and returns in the list, returns a list. The filter function operates on the list and returns a list. A fold or a reduce is not returning a list. It can return any other E. So here's an example. Folding of a list gave an integer. Now, if you have a list into a map, you can do a do more maps and so on. That is what I was trying. You can chain functions one after the other. Because you are staying in the list world or the list zone in these functions, in these high order functions. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, folks, now is a good time to ask questions. I'm going to talk, uh, attempt a, a more difficult concept now. Okay, guess not. Uh, here, there is a string. I love functional programming. It has been broken down to two substrings, some random uh, length within the size of this. So you get two substrings corresponding to the first part and second part. Given these two strings, I get back. On this list, I find the string length and then do a count. This is equivalent to the length of the original string. This is true for any string. There's a pictorial representation of the same. They use the word pages here. 
you can break down a, uh, some text into multiple pages. Find the count on each of them. And add them up. This count is equivalent to the word count on the original text. Does this seem intuitive? Yes. Now the there's a interesting thing here. String and concatenation with empty string is a monoid. Integer addition and zero is a monoid. And you can, the function string dot length. String dot length moves from the set type string to the set to the uh, type of integers. So if this were to be a list, it would be a list of integers, sorry, a list of strings. You can transform that to a list of integers. And you can find the sum of all of the integers. Or you can concatenate all the strings. Get a new string. Hold on, let me do it. will be the same. There is a subtle takeaway from here. Associative operators can be run parallelly. So map of a list can be done parallelly. Fold of a list can be done parallelly to a certain degree. This property is the one that is exploited by frameworks like Hadoop to parallelize and crunch data. So that the data being crunched, if it is a semi-group or a monoid, we can trust that parallelizing in frameworks like Spark and Hadoop will work. If not, the behavior is non-deterministic. Uh, folks, comments, questions? Can you give us an example of uh, non-deterministic behavior so that we understand? Instead of using addition, if you were doing some multiple, um, say subtraction. In Hadoop, you provide the map and reduce jobs. Map and reduce tasks. 
So you so saying it could subtract in any order? Yes, this is an example. Thank you. So I'm saying as programmers, if we understand the mathematics behind this, we can write uh, bug free or less bugs in a code. So far, I have demonstrated using a uh, list as a container, which wraps a data type, which forms a monoid. But I wanted to also highlight list itself is a monoid. The identity being an empty list and the operation being concatenation, you can fold a list itself to get uh, an element. So list are functors. Lists can, can contain monoids and process, but lists are also monoids. I demonstrate that over here, or maybe not. Yeah, but you get the idea. You can fold a list and you get an, uh, you can compress a list. Folks, remember how I spoke about functor is a pattern and list is an instance of a pattern. Whatever I spoke to you about lists, the same kind of mapping and uh, folding is true for a set as well. Like concepts can have hierarchies. I'm talking about the next construct. You can think of the subclass of functors called monads, which is what I'm going to talk about. List is a monad. There is an additional method called flat map, which I'll talk about. Similarly, set is also a monad, which means set is a monoid set is a functor and set has a flat map method. To make it more interesting, I will use sets for the rest of the session. What would be the number of elements in this set? Three. No, there's duplication. So sets have, have oh, duplication. Okay, okay. Yeah. Two. I have a small function which takes a string and returns its set of characters. So let's talk about first. The first function and uh, the first test here asserts that there are two elements in the list. Now, corresponding to hello, the set is H-E-L-O. It has four characters. Corresponding to hi, there is a set which has two characters, H and I. Now, similar to now, we are operating in the world of sets. A set dot map gives you a new set. A set dot flat map gives you a new set. Going back, how many unique characters are there when you convert this from a set of strings to a set of characters? It is H, E, L, O, and I. Of 
works doesn't make sense hello yes yes Six. Yeah. I want to focus on the signature here. In the world of lists, each element E can now generate a list by itself. Similarly, in the world of sets, each element can is mapped to a set of other elements, but the output is still a set. It's not a set of sets. So here, if you see this example, we just map get a set of sets and we fold over each of these sets. We union the resulting sets to get a new set. So H E L O was one set, H I was another set, H E L P was another set. We did not get duplication between the H, the three H's here, that the two L's and the two, the two E's and the two L's. So similar to how you can do a list dot map dot set dot, I mean, dot filter dot flat map, the same thing can be done in the world of sets. Set dot filter dot map dot flat map can be done. So for those of you who are familiar with asynchronous programming, promise dot map, promise dot filter, promise dot flat map are all following this pattern of state. Area. So a monad is a functor and a monoid, and it has a flat map method. That is a takeaway I wanted to have from this slide. Similar to functor laws, there are monad laws, but I will. Uh, Save it for later conversation. Uh, folks, I'm done from my side. I'm open to questions. In your example of flat map, you, you used to union as the kind of operator. No, 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 no. Internally, flat map uses a union. Okay. That is, I wanted to ask what is the default behavior? I thought you had defined this here. OK, hold on. If you take a list. Lists, you get multiple lists and you concatenate them into one single list. This is implement this uh, implementation detail of the flat map method. Similarly, Unioning of the each of this list is an implementation detail of the flat map. The test code does not know about unioning. For every string, it gives a set of characters. That is all this is doing. Finding each of the I mean, set of corresponding uh, set for each of them and unioning them is happening at the flat map level. Now,
if you were to draw here this empty list and concatenate forms a monoid set empty set and union is another monoid note that the operator is different between list and set does it help yeah so folks the patterns i i spoke about are algebraic structures which were monoid and semi group then functors and monads these are the four different patterns i introduced and elaborated in this session now once you understand how a list is a monad if somebody tells the set is a monad the cognitive uh, gap to understand set is lower because you can map it to a well established pattern there are a lot of other monads i can talk about them but the way you can i can reason about a factory method or template method or register pattern in a object oriented world if you understand the patterns of a functional programming world it will help you grasp and reason with them a lot more easier now unlike the object oriented world which has many many patterns the number of patterns you need to understand is, is lot fewer in the functional programming world that's a good thing any other questions uh, do you have reference uh, for learning on this Uh, a good reference would be my own blogs. So, yeah, I spoke about monoids and monads in a couple of blogs of mine. i try to be yeah i will paste these links uh, on the meetup page no worries yeah so instead of being very mathematical like some of the other material i found i try to make this more consumable um, for java programmers so you will find more terms and more uh, mathematical notations here i try to soften it up for programmers I, yeah, like Arvind will post it in the relevant forums. And Naveen has also shared the code that he showed today, so you will get the link for the code as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, guys? Thank you, Naveen. I had a question related to. Uh, like in today's session we have discussed the things as applicable to java right yes so like how much of it would be applicable to python as well uh, at least i understand the beginning part right the identity commutative property those sort of stuff are general 
you know from math and they are still applicable in python to some extent but uh, if you could uh, share the information it will be helpful because i'm okay. not not very familiar with uh, java honestly speaking yeah, sure uh, not a problem so in my session i have implemented my version of list this is not based upon the java's list implementation okay and i have implemented map flat map fold match on top of this assuming python has similar capability you you should be able to overlay all of these concepts in python yeah the map filter reduce those uh, features are there in python probably they derived it from you know languages like java if i'm not wrong uh, i'm not sure on that aspect but they do exist uh, a few other things that you mentioned uh, i'm i have to still uh, study about them I'm yeah folks uh, map is the first step the second step is fold most people tend to be familiar with map and fold flat map is where if i remember python doesn't support it and java has this weird syntax that you don't get it understand the flat map as well but hopefully the examples i gave give you an intuition of what a flat map is moment you get this it should be you can map it to i guess most programming languages okay that makes sense thank you you're welcome